There we go. And once again, welcome. We are very, very pleased to welcome Nick Lund this evening uh, to our program. And we are very pleased to welcome the Mid Coast Audubon Group. And to tell you a little bit more about that organization, I'm going to turn this over to Kit Pfeiffer. Kit? Thanks, Julia. Uh, just very briefly, Mid Coast, Mid Coast Audubon is uh, going to be 50 years old on December 6th. Quite an anniversary. We are an all volunteer organization and we do lots of activities. We've kind of had our wings clipped, may I say, for field trips, but hope to start those up again as soon as we can uh, be together. All ages and abilities are invited to go out and look, at, look for birds together. Um, monthly education programs such as this are the third Thursday of every month, October through April. And um, it's a wonderful partnership with Camden Public Library. Let me uh, give kudos to Julia and all of the staff there for making this possible and allowing us to reach so many more people with these programs on Zoom over this winter. We're very grateful for that. Uh, we offer scholarships, we give free bird feeders to schools and libraries, and all of the things that we do that happen to cost anything are made possible by your membership dues in Maine Audubon. So it's public radio fundraising week, so I can say thank you for doing your part. <laughs> so let me tell you about Nick Lund, a very fun and very distinguished presenter tonight. He is the Outreach and Network Manager to Maine Audubon, and he's also known as the Birdist, B-I-R-D-I-S-T, uh, a writer and blogger, focuses on birds and science, regular columns in the Portland Phoenix, he writes for National Audubon Society and many other publications. Uh, one of the most fun things that he writes, and it happens to be about the most popular on National Audubon site, is called Birdist's Rules of Birding, and his uh, sense of humor as well as his knowledge really shines through on those. And uh, you can follow his blog on the Birdist with a large following. So before Nick came back to Maine and joined Maine Audubon, he was Senior Manager of the Landscape Conservation Program at the National Parks Conservation Association in Washington, D.C. And there he advocated for the protection of national parks from oil and gas activities. Nick helped reestablish and lead the Washington DC Audubon chapter where he chaired the diversity and outreach committee. As I mentioned, Nick is a Maine native, born and raised in Falmouth. He holds a law degree from the University of Maine School of Law after going to undergraduate work away. He went over to Hamilton College in upstate New York. Please join me in welcoming Nick Lund. Nick, it's all yours. Hello, everybody. You know, it's hard. You don't get the same applause effect uh, that you do in person. So I'll just imagine that, it's, that people are going crazy in the crowd. Thank you. Thank you so much. Please, please settle down, everyone. Uh, we got to get started here. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, thank you to Kit. Uh, thank you to, uh, I see Juanita and Gail, and I'm sure there may be other uh, Mid Coast Audubon chapter members out there. Uh, and thank you to Julia and the Camden Public Library for having me today. Let's get into it, shall we? Uh, please bear with me while I share my screen and I am going to click a few buttons to get into the right uh, thing. Would she be right there? We feel good about what we're seeing? Looks Excellent. Good. Great. Thank you all. So uh, what we're going to be talking about today uh, is birds and the state of birds in Maine and how they've been changing uh, over the past few decades. So we'll get into it. But first, I am contractually obligated to begin with a slide such as this. Um, I work for Maine Audubon. Uh, Maine Audubon is the oldest and largest wildlife conservation organization in the state of Maine. We have been around, believe it or not, since 1843 when we started as the Portland Society for natural history. We were talking about, I don't know, sea monsters in the ocean and, and uh, you know, a long time ago. Um, we've grown since then um, to include uh, over 10,000 members around the state, 2,000 volunteers, um, seven chapters uh, around the state, including the uh, incredible Mid Coast chapter, uh, and eight wildlife sanctuaries uh, around Maine. Um, none, none really near Mid Coast, but um, closer down to Southern Maine for our Audubon chapters. Um, we connect people through wild, uh, connect people to wildlife. So our mission is to protect wildlife and wildlife habitat. 
And we do that through education, which means um, uh, working with thousands of school kids a year, pandemic or no. Um, conservation, so we have biologists on staff who monitor populations of Maine wildlife and uh, uh, develop ways to protect them. And then advocacy, so we take what we've learned from our scientists and we bring it to Augusta and to Washington to tell them how to do it best. So that's Maine Audubon. Really hope you can, uh, if you're not a member, that you can join us uh, and uh, that would be great. Um, we're talking about decades of change. We're talking about um, species range today. Um, why do species change, right? There are lots of reasons that a species may fluctuate their populations or their range. Um, some of them are human caused, some of them are natural. Um, and I wanna talk about sort of the different reasons that some different bird populations in Maine have changed over the past few decades. Um, so we'll just start by talking about, you know, what is a range? Uh, where do birds live? So the slide you see here um, is a sort of comparison of two very closely related birds, two warblers. On the left is the yellow warbler, and on the right is the yellow rumped warbler. Um, these are closely related birds. They're both, uh, they're both warblers, as I mentioned, but they have different ranges. You can see in the, in the maps uh, up above them um, where they live. The, the, the dark, the sort of reddish color is their breeding range in the summer. The yellow color is their migratory range where they can be found as they're passing from breeding to wintering grounds. And then the blue color is their, where they spend their winters, right? Um, and so you can see that these two very similar birds have different ranges. Um, you know, a lot of that uh, is dependent on how they've evolved, you know, what ecological niches they've evolved to exploit, right? So um, a yellow warbler uh, is, um, both of these birds have evolved to eat insects, first of all. And that's really important to understand why they have a migration, a breeding range in the north and a wintering range down the south. Uh, they migrate up north in the, in the summer where there are insects to eat. And then where there are no insects to eat, like in right now, uh, you got to get the heck out of here. So insect eating birds fly south in the winter. So both of these birds, because they eat insects for the most part, uh, fly north and south. Um, there are more subtle differences too. Um, yellow warblers uh, rely on uh, sort of lower vegetation, willows and things that exist further north in, up into Canada. That's why you see they, their range extends a little higher. Uh, but also interestingly, you see that uh, the yellow rump warbler there, you see that how the blue sort of r goes much higher into, north, uh, into the lower 48 than the yellow rump. Um, yellow rumps actually, you can find some of them in coastal Maine all year round. Um, they've actually evolved to uh, eat some fruits and also find insects uh, in, uh, in nooks and crannies. So they, are, they can cut down on their migration. They don't need to move so far. So um, small differences in how different bird species um, have evolved to lead their lives can have big differences on where they live, right, where their ranges are. Another good example of this is the common loon, right? Uh, common loons don't eat insects, right, um, but they do uh, need to migrate. Uh, this is a sort of a, the colors are a little flipped here on this map. Uh, the blue is the breeding, the summer range of the common loon, and the orange is the winter range. Um, of course, we all know common loons. We see them on our lakes, uh, our, our, yeah, lakes and uh, ponds in the summertime, a beloved main icon. Um, you know, they don't eat insects, but they got to leave those places in the winter. Why? Because the, it freezes, right? Uh, it's hard to swim around on a frozen lake. So uh, loons need to migrate uh, because uh, to find open water and open water uh, is the ocean, right? The ocean doesn't freeze. And you see that common loons, you know, they'll spend a lot of their time even uh, up north of Newfoundland uh, in the winter, the coldest winter. Uh, it's because uh, they're not worried about uh, finding insects, they just need to stay on open water. So that's another example of um, how ranges shift. So now let's get into talking about some, uh, why some of the ranges have changed over time, right? And we're gonna start with, uh, why some birds range has changed for natural reasons, right? And, you know, we got to start with this. Uh, you know, first of all, every bird in Maine has changed its range fairly recently. Um, about 18,000 years ago, uh, Maine was somewhere under this gigantic ice sheet, right? Um, not, many, not many birds flying around uh, in what is now Maine back then. Um, as uh, the climate has warmed over the past 18,000 years and uh, uh, vegetation has crept up into Maine, birds have followed. And so, um, you know, we have to understand that the birds that are here now uh, are ones that have followed the ice sheets up uh, into, into Maine. Um, but since they've been here, there are also other changes going on, uh, including for this 
very attractive bird right here. If this isn't the prettiest bird in Maine, it's in the top uh, some, it's in the bunch. Um, this is an evening grosbeak, um, a beautiful, uh, I, I, I wish it was called an evening grosbeak because it looks like a sunset. That's what I always thought. Um, but it's actually, uh, I think old people back in the day thought they only came out at night, uh, which is not true at all. So uh, I think that's where they got their name. Um, this is a big, beautiful finch. Um, finches have those big bills that they use to crack open seeds. You can see he's got, a, he's got quite the honker up there. Um, a very beautiful bird and, and one that um, used to be seen much more often in Maine. So this here is a chart showing um, evening grosbeak sightings over time in Maine. Um, and you can see there on the left, it starts at 1960, and on the right, it ends at 2014. And you can see there in the 70s and 80s, there was a big spike in even gross peak sightings, right? And then uh, in the early 90s, a real crash, really dropped down. Um, that mystified uh, lots of people. People didn't know what was going on, where were all our evening gross peaks. Um, it, uh, it was a real mystery. And, and it was one, um, that uh, didn't affect just evening grosbeaks. Um, here we have a couple more birds. Um, up in the top left, that is a female evening grosbeak, um, that little yellow collar. Um, to its right is a bay-breasted warbler. Uh, below that is a Tennessee warbler. And then to the lower left is a Cape May warbler, another stunner. Um, all of these species um, were uh, experiencing these big declines and birders didn't know really what was going on. Uh, until they made a couple interesting discoveries around this little guy. Um, so this, um, I won't call this a stunner. Um, I, I, um, it, you look, entomologists may disagree with me, but uh, so this is a, a, a worm, a caterpillar that turns into a moth uh, called an Eastern spruce budworm. Um, these are um, little insects which uh, uh, feed on spruce trees and they go through these huge cyclical population bursts um, you can see there that uh, major outbreaks breaks of these budworms occurred 1910 uh, to 20, 40 to 50, and 70 to 80. Um, when these um, uh, insects have an, uh, have an outbreak, they cover the spruce forest, and they are extremely damaging to spruce forests. Um, you know, spruce trees in Maine are, of course, a big uh, source, uh, an economic driver, and um, many forest managers, uh, you know, um, dread the emergence of spruce budworms because of the number they do on the forest. But scientists studying them also started to draw, um, con uh, draw connections between spruce budworm outbreaks and bird populations. So for example, if you think back to the chart I just showed of the uh, evening grosbeak sightings in the 70s and 80s, you see that that matches up right here with a spruce budworm outbreak of 70s and 80s. Um, and um, what scientists were able to do deduce is that it, birds feed on spruce budworms, right? And so when there is a huge outburst of spruce budworms, uh, many more birds can feed their young uh, with all this food, all these caterpillars around, and the populations of the bird rise to match the populations of the, um, the spruce budworm. And so what we see now is that right now in 2020-ish, there is another spruce budworm outbreak going on. It's a little bit smaller. Um, but you can see that um, over the past few years, the attendant populations of those birds are also increasing. So right here is a uh, chart showing, and this is a little confusing with all the colors, but um, it shows um, uh, 2014 to 2018 sightings of bay-breasted warbler. And you know the, the lesson from this chart is that the purple line is 2018. You can see that it's going way up, right? Um, same thing here with Tennessee warbler. And same thing here with Cape May warbler. So um, scientists are very clearly understanding the connection now between um, spruce budworm populations and the populations of these boreal birds that feed on them. And so really one of the lessons is that um, the fluctuations that have been shown in the evening gross beaks and these other birds are natural fluctuations. They're natural population fluctuations that follow the population fluctuations of these insects. And um, I, 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 if, if there was a show of hands in the room, I would ask you how many of you have seen evening gross beaks this year? Um, but I would suspect it's more than there were before. I saw my first in Cumberland County um, over my yard a couple of days ago. Um, this is, birders around the country are all a Twitter right now um, because there's a big uh, evening gross beak year. 
Um, part of that is because there's a big the evening growth speed population due in part to spruce, worm, spruce budworm. So these are good things um, and keep your eyes, keep some uh, black oil sunflower in your feeders right now uh, to try to track some, some gross peaks. Um, it also, uh, this understanding also helps us um, manage forests better, right? So like I mentioned, spruce budworm is a, considered a pest by timber companies. Um, who in years past, um, you know, sprayed them very heavily. This here is a, uh, a, a photo from 1955 in Canada. Um, that is DDT coming out of that airplane, um, trying to control spruce budworm. We, we of course know um, what DDT can do, and we'll talk about that a little later. So um, as we um, learn more about the connections between budworm and birds, we can maybe manage to find, out, find a medium spot. All right, moving on to another sort of natural range expansion. This is a really cool one. Um, these, this, is, uh, this little bird down there is a cattle egret, uh, a beautiful little wader. It's, in its, um, it's white most of the time with an orange bill, then it's breeding plumage. It gets that sort of orangey color. Um, these birds are native to Africa. They um, evolve to trail behind uh, megafauna, like rhinos and elephants, and eat the little insects that are picked up uh, as they're walking. Um, so this happens a lot in birding, where a bird will just, you know, because birds, this is one of the coolest things in birding, frankly, because bir birds have wings, they can fly, they can go wherever the heck they want. There's nothing to stop a bird from just picking up and flying to a different country if it is strong enough. Um, and fairly often um, in, throughout history, cattle egrets would fly, make their way accidentally across the Atlantic from Africa to South America. Um, and, uh, but you know, they showed up in the jungle, there wasn't a lot for them to survive on, and so they didn't survive. But as South America and the rest of the world and countries started um, bringing cattle around, um, some of these cattle egrets accidentally wound up in South America one day in 1937 and started hanging out with cattle, which are sort of like, you know, small elephants or, or buffaloes or, or that they're used to in Africa, and their populations subsisted. And so um, a natural accidental migration of uh, cattle egrets into South America has resulted in a, a huge population of cattle egrets in South uh, and North America. Um, so you can see here the sort of dates that cattle egrets work their way around uh, the various countries. Um, but cattle egrets uh, through, a, through a natural sort of human assisted means have um, hugely increased their populations uh, around the country. Um, cattle egrets are still very rare in Maine. That's mostly temperature related probably, um, but there are sightings and they are here. So um, that is the second and final natural uh, range change. And now we're gonna talk about some man-made changes. So as you can imagine, humans have had a giant impact on the landscape and um, our, uh, that, those, our fingerprints are all over uh, bird, different birds changing their ranges. Um, the first sort of subset of man-made change we'll talk about is land use and habitat loss. This is a big one. In Maine, we're talking about species like this. Um, one of the, look, I, might, I may say this for every bird, sorry, I'm a little biased. One of the most beautiful birds we have, um, this uh, very cute, deadly falcon. Uh, this is a American kestrel. Um, a colorful little falcons, they hunt things like uh, grasshoppers and dragonflies and, and uh, maybe maybe mice and things. Uh, beautiful little little bird of prey. Um, this is a tree swallow, um, an aerial insectivore uh, flying around uh, picking off insects in the air. Uh, and this very attractive bird, this is a bobolink, um, a very weird and cool bird with a sort of yellow cap there and a, a really famously crazy song. Um, these birds are not doing really great in Maine, right? Um, this is a graph showing um, uh, breeding bird survey routes in Maine over time. And you can see that um, from 1975 down to 2013, excuse me, um, American kestrels have really been on the decline. Um, for some better information, we can turn to breeding bird atlases. Uh, breeding bird atlases are the very comprehensive studies of birds uh, done in a particular state. Um, Maine, Maine's last breeding bird atlas was completed in 1983, I believe, and we are in the process right now of finishing our, an, a new one. So we don't have the data yet. 
um, but it'll be out in another year or two. Um, so, but we can look to data from other states like uh, Massachusetts, which has a similar, similar to Maine in a lot of ways, um, to get a sense of how Maine birds may be faring. Um, here's the chart for American kestrel in, uh, in Massachusetts. Um, you know, the key here is that a, a white triangle means an increase, a black circle means stable population, and a red triangle means decrease. You can see that kestrels have decreased everywhere in Massachusetts. They're really on the decline. Um, same here with tree swallow and bobolink. Um, both of those birds are way down. Why is this happening? What is going on? Well, what is the connection between all of those birds? They, they use fields, right? They're, they're, field, they're birds of open fields. Um, you see them a lot um, over farm fields, picking up flying insects. Um, bobolinks nest in sort of long grass fields. Um, kestrels, you'll see them most often, you know, on, on telephone wires near a farm. Um, they are birds of open country. And um, farms in particular and fields in Maine are, are in a steep decline in, uh, historically. So this here is a chart of um, both showing the number of farms and the percentage of the state of Maine in farmland over time. Um, this is over 20 years old, but this is the most recent I could find. And you can see that in the, eight, the 1880s and 1890s, um, there were uh, uh, over 30% of the state of Maine was in farmland. Over 30% of the entire state of Maine was farm. Um, today, that number is just over 5%. So, and actually I'm not sure, I'm sure it's even less than that since 1997. Um, but you can see there's been a, a massive increase in, uh, in farmland in the state. Uh, this is the habitat that these birds rely on. Now you could, you could say, and this has happened in many cases, that um, sometimes farmland grows up and becomes forest. In, in that case, um, you're not, you may be losing habitat for the grassland birds, but you're gaining habitat for forest birds. And so from a sort of a biomass perspective, you could argue that it's, uh, it maybe works out. Um, but that's not what we're seeing most of the time. Um, a lot of these farmlands are becoming uh, developed. Um, and when you have human development land, um, you're not getting the replacement species back, or at least, um, you know, the unique species. Um, it's a sort of, a, it's a net loss in biodiversity for sure. Um, and so um, human development across the state of Maine, especially as it is replacing uh, fields, uh, is really doing a number on our grassland birds. Um, there are plenty of things you can do to help, of course. Um, uh, kestrels and tree swallows both nest in, um, in tree cavities, naturally. Um, and you can, and bird boxes are a great mimic for tree cavities. Um, so if you can uh, put up, if you have a, uh, a, an appropriate field nearby or other appropriate habitat and want to work to put up tree swallow boxes or kestrel boxes, um, we heartily encourage you to do so because um, they'll work. All right, some other land use changes. Um, let's see if this works. So there's a bird in this picture. Let's see if you can see it. Here it goes. Um, there's a bird sitting down on the beach. There he goes, there's his butt, there's his butt and his legs. And here comes his friend. There we go. So these are um, shorebirds. These are piping plovers. You may have heard that name before. These are piping plovers. And what they are doing is a changing of the guard on their eggs right now. Um, the, what kind parents? The, I'm not sure if it's the male or female, but the, the bird standing up is shielding the eggs from the sun uh, with his or her wings while the other parent uh, takes its sweet time in, in nestling in there. Oh, I'll see you later. That was just a, just a fig out, I guess. Um, these are piping plovers. They nest on the beach right here. So if you are familiar with a, with a beach, you know, you can see that that's sort of a, that line of seaweed there. Um, nesting on the beach is a dangerous place to, to be, right? Because um, you're, you're open and exposed. And um, so you need to be very well camouflaged. You see that this piping plover matches almost identically with the color of the sand. And also that it's piping, the black piping, um, matches the sort of the seaweed, that, that dried seaweed up there. It's pretty ingenious. Um, this is what they're protecting, by the way, this little cute little nugget. Um, beaches are also uh, a challenging place because people really like beaches, right? Um, people like to go to beaches, to let their dogs run around on beaches. Uh, and so uh, piping plovers and other beach nesting birds in Maine have um, really taken a hit. Um, we don't have a ton of uh, sandy beaches um, and the ones we do have are very popular. And so um, birds like piping plovers and least terns um, uh, in the 50s, 60s, 70s, their populations were way down, nearly extinct in Maine. But 
um, and Audubon is here to help. And since the early 80s, we have worked um, with municipalities all over, mostly southern Maine, where these uh, sandy beaches are, um, to find nests, to cordon off the nests, protect the nests, to work with um, beachgoers and municipalities to protect these nests. And, you know, we're seeing our advocacy work. Um, so uh, here you see the number of uh, uh, piping pullover pairs and nestlings, pairs in blue and nestlings in red, um, going up, going way up. Um, uh, and it's been big news. We've had incredible success so much that we're, that um, our piping plover crew at Maine Audubon is, is, uh, is overwhelmed. Uh, and I'm proud to, um, to say that these numbers, which are uh, from 2015, are out of date. We are up over um, 99 pairs in the state now with um, almost 200, 198 pairs, or 198 chicks fledged, um, which is way up off the top of this chart here. So um, it's working, this advocacy works when we do it. Um, this, this beautiful least tern is another example. Um, this is another beach nesting bird that we work with to protect and they similarly are having um, a great resurgence. Um, the numbers from 2020 are 258 pairs now in, in the state of Maine. That's great. So um, that's a natural land use change that we've worked with some education to, to help prevent. Um, some birds benefit from uh, land use changes, right? So when I was talking before about um, uh, fields being turned into developments, you know, one bird that loves human habitation is, is the cardinal. Um, uh, cardinals love sort of dense shrubs and, um, and, and just the type of thing that people plant between their, you know, at the edges of their gardens or between their houses. Um, and so cardinals have flourished in Maine over the past few decades. Um, um, some people may remember if you were birding out in the you know 60s and 70s how rare it was to see a cardinal. Not anymore. Uh, we see them all over the place. Um, that is due largely in part to the types of um, plants that humans have planted as we've come in. Uh, another one is these guys, um, especially in the winter. Um, Eastern bluebirds used to be very rare in the winter in Maine. Um, you can see here that has changed uh, very quickly. Um, even in the 90s and uh, even in the 90s, eastern bluebirds uh, during Christmas bird counts in the winter were, um, were, were few and far between. Um, that has changed dramatically. Um, a lot of that is due to slightly warming temperatures and a lot of that is due to um, eastern bluebirds um, being able to feed on, na on um, things like cherry trees and uh, other non-native uh, fruiting winter trees that we planted, also some native trees as well. Um, so bluebirds are much more common now in the winter than they used to be. Um, so I, I sort of conclude every little section here with a what can you do section and what can you do on land use and habitat loss is plant native plants. Um, native plants are um, by far the most important thing you can do to give native birds the food they need to survive and that food means caterpillars and spiders mostly. Um, uh, almost every single bird that we have feeds caterpillars to its young and um, caterpillars uh, grow up uh, in close connection with particular plants. So if you plant um, native plants, you'll get native caterpillars, not crazy bugs and things. You'll get attractive, cool caterpillars that turn into cool moths and butterflies. And birds can, can feed on those caterpillars and, and nest right there in your yard. Your yard. So um, Maine Audubon, uh, we have a number of um, sources to help you figure out what plants might work in your garden. Um, we sell plants all throughout the summer. Um, but we encourage you as the, when, when the time is right again, to, to plant native plants in your garden because um, that can help counteract land use changes and habitat loss. All right, the second category of, of man-made change is direct interaction. This is humans um, uh, not messing with habitat, really going after the birds. Um, this is the first one here. Um, look at this handsome devil. This guy's looking pretty, looking pretty proud of himself with, uh, he, I don't think he knows what's coming up in a week, um, but um, this is a wild turkey, of course, and wild turkeys are native to Maine, um, but uh, were overhunted and extirpated from the state around the 1900s. So this is direct interaction, this is hunting. Um, uh, we, we hunted them out. Um, they were uh, reintroduced, and some folks on this call probably know much more about it than I do. They're reintroduced in the mid-coast area um, in the 70s and 80s. You can see um, here on this slide, um, on the left there, I mentioned the main breeding bird atlas. This is a picture of the wild turkey page from the 80s, the early 80s, 
the, the, the black dots indicate the presence of the bird. You can see up in the Midcoast area, there was some wild turkeys and then down in York County, there were some wild turkeys. That's about it. Um, on, the, on the right, this is a, a picture taken from eBird. This is a bird sighting um, database. And the blue pictures are, are wild turkey sightings um, last year. And you can see that they're, they're everywhere. So all over the coast of Maine, up through uh, Washington County, all the way up into Rustic County, through Baxter, even up through the mountains. Um, wild turkeys, uh, they're meant to be here, right? They're native here. Uh, we, um, we corrected ourselves on our hunting pressures and we, we um, put some restrictions on how many we can hunt and it's worked great. They're coming back gangbusters. Um, and I should say too, um, and I don't wanna spoil things, but um, when we look at the number of birds, so I mentioned before the Massachusetts Bird Atlas, this is a quick slide of the birds that have increased the most since their previous atlas. And you can see wild turkeys are right at the top. Um, I don't wanna spoil the rest of it, so I'm gonna move on past it, but wild turkeys are doing exceptionally well. Here's another one that's doing great. This is such a good story. Um, so the direct interaction here was of course DDT. Um, May, uh, all over the country, uh, humans would spread DDT, uh, a pesticide uh, that uh, had the effect as it worked its way through the food chain to these birds of prey, mostly through fish, um, of um, producing eggs that were much, much weaker. They were th these thin eggs that as the uh, bald eagles or ospreys would incubate the eggs, the eggs would break underneath them. And so, uh, uh, ospreys and bald eagles experienced huge crashes in population in the 50s and 60s. Um, and, um, you know, the loss of this iconic species really spurred um, the environmental movement, right? Along with um, things like Silent Spring uh, from Rachel Carson from Maine. Um, so um, uh, we, again, gathered ourselves together. We recognized what the problem was and we worked to solve the problem, which was banning DDT. Um, let's see how that worked. As we all know, it works really, really well, right? Um, um, that over there, this is a, a main, um, the top one is a main chart of bald eagles in Maine. You can see there were basically zero bald eagles seen in the 40s and 50s, uh, up through you know the early 70s and early 80s. They were, bald eagles are very hard to come by. Um, um, bald eagles now are um, uh, skyrocketing, right? So the latest gra uh, image on this graph is uh, just over 400. As of 2018, there were over 730 pairs of bald eagles in the state of Maine. Um, uh, ball, uh, ospreys have experienced a similar resurgence. And it just, again, shows you what, what we can do when humans recognize our own impact, put the brakes on it, and change it. Um, these birds come back. It works. Um, loons are another one. Loons are a, a bird that uh, humans are impacting quite uh, in a number of different ways. Um, but one of the most predominant is lead poisoning, believe it or not, lead poisoning. So um, how do birds, uh, how do loons die from lead poisoning? Um, well, um, birds don't have teeth, right? Uh, and so they need to find other ways to chew their food. Um, you know, loons swallow these fish whole, and so they need a way to, to grind them up to digest them. And so what uh, loons and a lot of birds do is they, um, will dive to the bottom of the lake and swallow pieces of, swallow little rocks, swallow pieces of gravel and rock, which goes into their gizzard, a special organ, which grinds the food up, right? So, um, so these loons are diving to the bottom, um, they are picking uh, rocks off the bottom and swallowing them. Um, so look at this image here, and then here are the lead sinkers that are in that image. So this is the same image with the lead sinkers um, and fishing gear that are circled. So um, fishermen you who lose, use lead tackle, sometimes that stuff falls off the line and sinks to the bottom where it nestles among the rocks. And it looks, um, even in this view, um, which uh, is without any swirling water or sediment, um, it, it's almost impossible to determine what's a rock and what's a lead sinker. Um, to a loon, they don't even know what lead sinkers are, right? So this is how loons get, uh, get lead in their body. Um, and it only takes um, one or two pieces of lead uh, to cause lead poisoning in a loon and kill them. Um, again, Maine Audubon has been working um, since the early 80s on uh, loon surveys, the, the annual loon count. And as part of that, we, we work with fishermen uh, and other organizations to reduce the amount of lead tackle. 
Um, and um, we have another a number of other initiatives. We work with um, lake associations to reduce boat wake um, and, and take other things. And the result, once again, is that populations of loons are recovering, right? So um, since when Maine Audubon started a loon count to, um, to now, we've almost doubled the number of common loons in Maine. Um, so again, direct action can work when we recognize what we're doing. Okay, here's, an, here's another direct action. This one's a little, a little different. Um, this, uh, these are house finches, right? You may have these uh, at the feeders in your backyard. Um, believe it or not, house finches are not native to Maine. Um, they are native to the West Coast and the, and the Southwest especially. Um, but there was some direct interaction involved with bringing them to Maine. Um, so uh, back in the early 1900s, uh, pet stores um, used to import uh, house finches from the Southwest and sell them on the East Coast. They would market them as Hollywood finches um, and to try to spice them up a little bit. Um, and uh, that was going on until the Migratory Bird Treaty Act uh, prohibited the sale of native birds. Um, and so when that passed, all these pet store owners were like, oh, what do I do with all these finches I got? So they would just open the cage and let them fly out. Uh, and so uh, after the Migratory Bird Treaty Act was passed, you, you started seeing all these giant spikes in house uh, finch populations, um, and they have done quite well for themselves. Uh, it's resulted in this very interesting split now in the sort of the traditionally native population of house sparrows, which is on the west, and the introduced population of house sparrows which is on the right here, all the east coast, and they sort of are, haven't met in the middle yet. They're still sort of uh, working their way towards each other. Um, so there's, if you go to the, um, uh, the Great Plains there, you, you, it's one of the few places in the country you don't find house finches. Um, so that's a direct interaction where we just let them go out in the air. Um, a similar story occurred with this little guy. Um, this is a bird called a Eurasian collared dove. Um, it looks, you know, it's very similar in um, size and shape to a morning dove, a little bigger, and it's got that collar on its neck. Um, again, not native to North America at all, um, but was um, uh, found in pet stores. Uh, one of those pet stores, or a few of them, were in southern Florida, and um, an area, of course, prone to hurricanes. And the, the true story is that um, some pet stores were damaged from some hurricanes in the early 80s, and Eurasian collar doves escaped and established themselves in the country. And, and I want to show you what that establishment looks like. Um, here is a map from eBird, that website I mentioned before, of Eurasian collar dove sightings in North America. Um, this is um, between 1900 and 1988. And the purple, you can see in southern Florida, there's a couple other purple ones. That's, that's where there are birds. So you can see southern Florida had some, and then there may be a few other what are likely escaped birds um, uh, places around the country. So I'm going to show you, I'm going to scroll through the years here, and we'll see, watch how the purple has expanded. So 1991, you can see a little more in Florida, 1993, 1996, 1999, 2002, 2005, 2008, 2011. And now, now, you can see that just in that short amount of time, these Eurasian collar doves have conquered the entire country. Uh, it's pretty remarkable uh, what they've been able to do. Um, you will notice that for whatever reason, and I don't know, and I don't know if folks really know, they, there, there aren't many of them on the East Coast. Um, they've gone all the way up into Alaska, but we don't see them regularly in Maine. Um, however, of course, here is, uh, the first. Um, my colleague Doug Hitchcock makes sure I put this slide in, uh, in this presentation because he saw Maine's first ever record of Eurasian collar dove. I've never seen one uh, and he likes to just stick it to me a little bit, which I uh, will tolerate because he's a nice guy. Um, but this, this in Falmouth uh, in, um, what year was this? 2013 was the first state record of Eurasian collar dove. And they are still very rare, um, but occur uh, uh, once every other year or so, and we may expect some more of them. So keep your eye out. They're pretty easy to identify. They're a little lighter colored, and they have that collar around the neck. Another bird we might be seeing some more of is, uh, are these birds, um, especially the one on the right. So these are turkey vulture, or well, these are vultures. On the left is the turkey vulture with the 
the silver trailing edge to the wings. Um, the bird, the lower bird on the right, the front bird is a black vulture. That's another species of vulture. Um, they are all black with some broader wings and they have silver on the uh, sort of the, on their hands or the tips of their wings. That's how you tell them apart. Um, black vultures are very common throughout the country, um, but they're not common at all in Maine. They're, they're still very rare here, but we do believe they're coming. They're, they're on their way. Um, and we know because um, we've seen it before. So turkey vultures actually used to be very rare in Maine, believe it or not. Um, uh, only in the past few decades are turkey vultures regular uh, visitors to Maine and breeders. So the, the first ever breeding pair of turkey vultures was 1982 in world famous Camden, Maine. Um, I actually don't know where exactly that is. I should, I should know. But so turkey vultures now are uh, very commonly seen throughout the summer. Uh, and we expect black vultures to follow uh, in the next few years. Um, all right, I want to uh, keep moving along here because I see the time is ticking. Um, what you can do with di so um, direct interaction, there's a lot of different things you can do. Um, take you the lead out of your tackle box, uh, make sure you adhere to hunting guidelines. If any of you out there are spraying DDT in your yard, I ask you to please stop doing that. That's very illegal. Um, so there are lots of things you can do. Um, Maine Audubon has lots of resources depending on the species. Um, so the final uh, subset here of man-made change is climate change, right? So let's talk about that a little bit. Um, we know we are seeing some species in Maine because the climate is warming up to the point where they can survive now. This is one of them. Um, do you guys have this in Camden, these birds? Um, yeah, this is a, uh, this is one of the most poorly named birds. It's sort of a, um, often laughed at for, for being named so poorly. This, of course, is the red-bellied woodpecker. Um, there is a red-headed woodpecker out there already, and if you saw that bird, you're like, yeah, that, that's more red on the head. That should get it. Um, the red on the belly, if you can look between this bird's legs, it, you know, the name for this bird came from when people used to see birds up close by shooting them. And when you, you know, hold a bird, this bird in your hand and look between its legs, you see it's got a little bit of a red on its belly. I've never seen it in person. I know it's there, but, um, but this is the red-bellied woodpecker, right? Red-bellied woodpecker. And um, what we've seen is a, a market increase uh, of red-bellies in Maine um, just in the past 20 years. Um, you can see here there is the, the red line is uh, red-bellied woodpeckers in Maine. The blue line is um, New Hampshire. Um, I don't really know what accounts for the up and down jaggedness of these uh, of these lines, but you can see that it is a, it is a steady increase. Um, I had them at my feeders today in Cumberland, um, and they are here. Um, how do we know that red-bellied woodpeckers are, um, are uh, coming because of climate change? So this is something called Bergman's rule, right? So Bergman's rule is a, uh, a rule in science which says that when you have an animal uh, that lives, that range ex extends from the equator to the poles, say, um, that the individuals of that species near the equator will be smaller than the ones further north, right? So black bears are a good example, I think. Black bears live all the way from Florida all the way up to Maine and above. Um, on average, the individual black bears in Florida are smaller than the ones in Maine. So we know that there is this sort of gradual uh, change in species bodies mass as, they, um, as the climate gets colder. Um, and um, red-bellied woodpeckers fit that pattern perfectly. So in the 1950s, before there were red-bellied in Maine, um, you would have red-bellied in Florida and then all the way up through you know, the mid-Atlantic. The ones in the mid-Atlantic on the northern part of their range were the largest of the population. Um, and the ones in Florida were the smaller. Um, now, as these birds have moved up, the ones in Maine are the largest red-bellied woodpeckers we have, and the ones in the mid-Atlantic are smaller, right? So that's, that's what's really important here, is that we see this, this gradial shift, uh, according to Bergman's rule, of red-bellied woodpecker populations as we go. Um, and, you know, and we don't need scientific rules to know that we're seeing lots of different species that we didn't used to. Um, Carolina wrens, smooth mud crab, um, uh, black sea bass. I mean, these are species that for decades and thousands of years um, lived in the warmer parts, warmer waters, uh, warmer uh, temperatures, uh, but now we're seeing them in, in Maine. I have a Carolina wren in my yard right now. Um, 
so we know that the climate is changing and these species are moving in accordance with it. Um, some of the most uh, important research done recently by the National Audubon Society um, on their um, a report called Survival by Degrees, and said that two thirds of North American birds are at risk of extinction from um, global temperature rise. And I wanted to pull out a couple of their um, uh, reports for Maine specifically. So um, what you see here are three different maps showing different projections for climate moving forward on the range of the common loon. So uh, on the left here in the, in the orange, that's the current um, range of the common loon. Um, under, uh, by 2080, so 50 years from now, uh, 60 years from now, um, under a 1.5 degree change um, is the middle slide and the red means that that bird can't live there any longer. So you see much of Southern Maine uh, up, up in the mid coast will probably not be uh, habitable for common loons uh, under 1.5 degrees. Under a three degree uh, rise, um, most all of Maine and you know, parts of Quebec uh, become uninhabitable, right? Here's for the bobolink, um, that's orange uh, on the left, uh, cutting across Maine, 1.5 by 2080. Um, most all of Southern Maine will be um, uninhabitable for them. And then uh, three degrees, uh, most all of their current range is uninhabitable. Um, you see interesting there, you know, this is, this is a scientific report. Uh, it's not, uh, birds are expected to gain other range uh, further north, right? So as the habitat changes and um, trees move up north, you know, bobolinks range are expected to shift upwards. So it's not necessarily that their entire population will crash. Um, it's possible that their population will continue just further north and outside of Maine. Um, uh, a similar story here for uh, wood thrush. So you'll see that um, wood thrush are basically sort of the top end of their range in Maine now. Um, you could see, so if you go all the way over to 20 to three degrees by 2080, you see that their range in the south is likely to, to be too hot for them, but their range in Maine is actually probably going to improve uh, with a three degree warming. So um, there's a lot to these climate reports. As the habitat changes, the, the birds that inhabit those habitats change. Sometimes there's more habitat, sometimes there's less, but there's little doubt that uh, the, the species mix that we are accustomed to and has existed for so long in Maine uh, will change. Um, here's a general, a more general slide uh, for that, um, showing um, for Maine in particular, which types of birds will do better and which will do worse. Um, the red um, species that go over on the right there, those are ones that are expected to um, become more, you know, to decline in Maine. Um, a, a, as a three degree climate warming. A lot of those are our boreal forest birds. So a lot of northern Maine um, migratory birds that we think of warblers and things, um, the habitat will just shift uh, up for them. Um, a, lot of the, a lot of these bird, birds nest in the boreal woods, which Maine is basically the southern extent of. And as that moves up, the birds will be forced to go with them. Um, we expect to see increases in, you know, um, birds you think of as southern Maine birds right now, eastern forest birds, non-boreal birds, and then generalists, um, you know, things like um, cardinals and starlings and things like that. So, you know, that's a bit of a dire message, but guess what? We're not afraid of this, you know, our generation right now and the people who are working, we're not afraid of climate change and we are uh, working to reduce its impact. Um, Maine Audubon has been working our tails off on something called uh, Maine's Climate Action Plan, which has been developed by the governor and was approved just a few days ago and is set for release on December 1st. Um, there are some awesome um, guidelines and policies in the new Climate Action Plan that will help guide us to more renewable energy, more electric vehicles, things that will cut down on our uh, emissions and, and, you know, prevent those scenarios from occurring that we see. And we're ready to do it, you know. Uh, we're not scared of this, um, just like, you know, prior generations weren't scared of DDT and weren't scared of lead and weren't scared of the other things. Uh, we know that we can fix this if we, if we work on it. So um, we'll need all your help watching as well. And with that, I am done. And I see there's some time for questions. I see that there are questions to be quested. And so um, fire them away. All right, yes, we'll jump right in. We have a number of questions that have already come in. First of all, Nick, thank you. That was very clearly presented and I appreciate that. Um, so Karen asks, the map for the yellow rumped warblers shows their wintering range covering down here in Maryland. However, we were seeing them here during the summer. Why would that be? 
they, um, so the, the thing about migration is that it's dangerous, right? Birds don't want to migrate if they don't have to. Um, and so for birds that have learned, so because you're flying a long distance, it's tiring. Um, so for birds who figured out to not migrate, then they don't need to. So that's probably what happened in Maryland and Maine. Um, uh, birds uh, have figured out that they can stick around, uh, especially in, in um, Western Maryland, I imagine, Cumberland, um, and then uh, spend their winters uh, all over Maryland. So that would be my guess. Um, I know that's what's happened in Maine. They sort of have gone from a very migratory bird to less so of a migratory bird. So that may be what's going on with you too. All right, this is from a little earlier in the presentation. James asked, what is the landlocked wintering loon spot on Nick's map in the Southeast US? Good question. Uh, I don't know. Good question. Um, it, what it may be is a large uh, reservoir of some kind. Um, you know, a lot of birds are like this, ducks especially. They only migrate as far as they need to to avoid frozen water. Uh, and so um, if they can find a place like a big reservoir or lake in the southwest that doesn't freeze over, uh, then they're good. I, I lived in Mississippi for a brief period and we have these big reservoirs down there. And you get loons all over the place in the winter because they, don't, they never freeze solid. Um, so I don't know what particular place that was, but um, I'm sure it is uh, a, big, a big old lake. Hmm, thank you. Um, Sue asks a good question, and I was going to ask the same thing if nobody else did. On some of your charts, uh, the eagle chart, I think, was the last one we looked at, um, there was something called birds per party hour. What does that right. mean? You know, it sounds like a fun party, doesn't it? Now it that, does. I love a bird that, party. Yeah, that sounds like something <laughs> I want to go to. Uh, birds for party hour simply controls for uh, the number of people looking for birds. So, um, you know, back in, you know, say 1900, when you had one person looking for birds, they would naturally find far fewer birds than today when you have a thousand people. So birds for party hour is simple, simply a formula that, um, that evens that out. So it's um, how many birds each person sees over an hour not how many total birds are seen, if that makes sense. So it's a way to compare bird sightings over time when you have different amounts of people watching. Okay, yeah. Um, Jan says, stunning photo of the lead sinkers. And yes, it was. I, I noticed like one or two before you put the circles on because I figured that's where you were going, yeah. but wow. Uh, she mentions avian haven in freedom treats many loons that have ingested these sinkers. Yeah, shout out to avian haven, they do great work. Yes, they do. Um, um, Carol is uh, mentioning back to your earlier conversation. She said sparrows or finches when you were talking Did about Did I say them. house? Uh, I, may have, I may have been in the house sparrow. Um, so ha both house finches and house sparrows are uh, introduced birds. They are different. Um, uh, 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 house sparrows are from uh, Europe. Um, they are part of a huge group of birds, starlings included, where, you know, Europeans would come over in the, in the 1800s and they, they would say, you know, they say, I have a great idea. Let's bring all my European species over with me and we'll release them out. Of course. And that's how we got starlings. That's how we got house sparrows, also known as English sparrows. So, yes, I was talking about house finches there, but I, but I could do another thing on house sparrows if we wanted to. No. Oh. Jane mentions um, red-bellied woodpecker is an occasional visitor in our Cushing backyard. And James says also in friendship. And I mentioned, because you had brought up the, the turkey vultures, um, we recently had Don Reamer give us a presentation for Midcoast Audubon, and he did a talk about turkey vultures. So if anyone wants to check that out, we have the recording on the Camden Public Library Program's YouTube channel. Um, I think Don was on the call tonight. Um, hey, Don. <laughs> we also Feel free have. To email me any corrections. Oh, yes. <laughs> we also have the, uh, the red bellied woodpecker in Booth Bay Harbor, Sue says. And so they're all the way up. I'm not sure how far they've been seen up, but they are, they're here for sure. And it used to be, I remember when I started birding, you know, in the early 2000s, it was, uh, it was a, you know, call your friends type of bird. It was a uh, get the word out because people might want to see this. Now it's like, you know, I don't even look twice um, when I see them. So jaded. <laughs> jaded. Yeah. Um, Lillian says that they have a red-bellied woodpecker here in Hollis, Maine, and that they live on a pond. Um, Grace Starr is saying thank you. And uh, Margaret asks, what is the coolest bird you've seen in oh. Maine and where? Oh, It's like picking a favorite Man. kid, right? <laughs> what a great question. Um, the coolest bird, okay, a quick story. You sure, I'm sure you all have heard of this bird already, but um, 
like I mentioned back in the, think back to the cattle egret talk. Mm -hmm. So, right, so the coolest thing about birds is that sometimes they just pick up and fly to a weird place. It's the most exciting part of birding because, you know, birds have defined ranges and then all of a sudden one just shows up where it shouldn't be. Um, and that's what really gets birders' hearts racing. Sometimes it's a bird from uh, like Pennsylvania, you know, that shows up here. That's pretty cool, Pennsylvania. Sometimes it's a bird from Florida that shows up here. That's pretty cool. That's a long way. Sometimes it's a bird like the great black hawk, which has never been seen north of Mexico and then showed up in Deering Oaks Park in Portland. Um, the great black hawk is a, it, it, um, did anybody see that bird? Raise your hand if you saw that bird. Um, an incredible giant uh, bird of like open grasslands that, you know, mostly eats snakes and stuff. Um, just showed up in, you know, a city park in Portland and hung out for months at a time. Um, it did not survive. Uh, shout out again to Avian Haven for, for doing their best job to, to, uh, to rehabilitate. But, you know, this bird, this whole species has probably never seen snow in its life, right? Any of its, you know, compatriots. Uh, and so that bird was probably the coolest I've ever seen. It was certainly the, the rarest. A great black hawk had never been seen in the United States before, ever. Um, this individual was actually seen first in Texas as it flew over somebody's head in Texas. Um, and showed up eventually in Maine. So it's just such an incredible story. And it's just why I love birding. You know, you're sitting there and all of a sudden you get a phone call saying, hey, there's a, there's a South American hawk in Portland. Um, that doesn't happen with, with anything else. Hmm. Um, Nick, this is a comment from Janet Allen. And she says that, uh, thank you so much for writing pieces for us at the Portland Phoenix. Hey, my pleasure, uh, it's a great paper. Yes, and Jean says yellow cardinal last winter in Nobleboro. Oh, yellow cardinal, very cool. Get pictures, you'll go, you'll go viral. <laughs> Dan says, I've heard a lot about declining global insect diversity and in numbers. Has this been correlated with declines in insectivorous birds? Yeah, absolutely is the answer, absolutely. So, you know, in combination with a lot of factors, habitat loss included, um, uh, rising temperatures included. Um, insect, insect numbers uh, across the board are way down. Um, it's, it's, it's been a relatively recent revelation because insect biomass wasn't something that people measured a lot uh, in prior years. And so, so it's just now as we're finding some data to compare about historical um, numbers, but, um, and I don't know them off the top of my head, but, but there have been some very alarming studies about the, just the number of insects that uh, birds need. And um, or that exist. Uh, birds eat insects. Um, even birds that eat fruit um, feed insects to their young because insects, you know, if you think about a caterpillar, which bursts out in the spring and summer, um, they're like little protein burritos that birds can feed their young. Um, they are by far the most important food source for 98% for of um, uh, terrestrial birds. Um, and so without native plants that support these uh, insects and without uh, with temperatures that aren't you know, incorrect for these insects to live um, and pesticides that are killing them, these insects are gone and the birds just can't survive. And so absolutely there's a very strong connection between general insect declines and, uh, and, and the birds that feed on them. And so again, the best thing that you can do in your backyard, and one of the things I love about this solution is that you can do it in your backyard, uh, is plant native plants because that brings back the insects that they need. Yeah, and if only the stinking brown tail moth caterpillar would be a good source of food, but it's not. <laughs> I know why. Maybe one day they'll develop it. We could just get a, gotta, better, get a better recipe. They gotta develop a taste for it. Put a little Tabasco yeah. on it. It's delicious. <laughs> um, Chrissy says, uh, you said that species trend larger the further north from the equator. I noticed that with chipmunks, that they are larger here in Washington, D.C. area than in Maine. Is that, is that an exception to the, quote, bird man's rule? Uh, I don't know. Um, I don't know much about um, uh, how chipmunks are doing down there. I, um, there's a lot of good oaks in, in DC uh, and you know maybe they're eating some holy donut or something down there. <laughs> um, uh, or uh, what's or I used to live in DC. What, what's the name of the donut store I used to go to all the time? Anyway, um, there are a number of factors locally that could result in different populations of animals being bigger or smaller. Um, it's a really sort of widespread general trend. Um, I, would, I would not assume that the, uh, these chipmunks are an exception to um, Bergman's rule, B-E-R-G-M-A-N-N, -N. Um, but, uh, but I can't speak to the particulars. 
All right, we'd only have time for one or two more questions. Um, Beth wanted to know, did you mention the effect of cats? I hear that cats are now playing a role in the decline of birds. Yeah, so the, the US Fish and Wildlife Service does uh, mortality estimates of birds um, each year from human causes. Uh, the number one cause is habitat loss. Uh, the number two cause is cats. So cats kill over a billion birds per year. Um, um, and the number three cause is, bird, is uh, window collisions um, between 365 and 900 some odd million birds per year die uh, by colliding with windows. So um, please keep your cats inside. Um, cats are killers, that's what they do. They, they hunt birds. Uh, and so um, letting cats uh, roam around, um, th there's no two ways about it. Um, they, they, they kill birds. Um, also, Maine Audubon has launched our Bird Safe Maine uh, program, which is working with uh, um, the city of Portland to start, and then groups, uh, individuals, and anybody around the state to uh, help uh, protect their windows. Um, windows reflect habitat, they reflect the sky, and so birds can fly right into that because they don't know what windows are. Um, and they die, uh, about a million birds a day around the country die from flying into windows. Oh my um, goodness. There are a number I of, number of no solutions. Idea. Yep, number of solutions to, uh, re to just basically let a bird know that a window is there and, uh, and that's something you can do. Thank you, yeah, I had no clue that the number was so huge. Um, yep. Real quick, a couple last questions. Um, can you say anything about snow geese in Maine? Lillian says that she had three migrate through Hollis on Deer Pond and they stayed for a day and a half and that she has a couple pictures. Send me those pictures. Um, um, Snow geese are rare but annual in Maine. They are um, mostly winter in, um, their closest winding ground is like the Chesapeake and then when I lived in Mississippi I would see millions of them uh, in fields down there. And so they are, um, they're part of that phenomenon where sometimes birds will sort of just migrate a little bit out of their way and, and show up. Um, Oh, tundra swans, you said. Is that what you said? No, it was, uh, it was oh, yes. a snow geese, yeah. Snow geese, okay, same thing. Yeah. So t there are also some uh, three tundra swans in Maine uh, the other day, which are uh, experiencing the same thing. Um, they migrate, they winter in the Chesapeake, and some of them probably just, you know, went a little bit out of their way and showed up in Maine. So that's probably what's happening. That's a great sighting, and congratulations. So if somebody does want to send you a picture or, or something like that, how can they reach you? And Lund at mainaudubon.org. Let me put it in the chat right there. All right. Um, send it to me and uh, that would be great. Last question, I promise. Um, I, Charles asks, what determines the loon's southern breeding range? Yeah, that's a really good question. I, I don't know the exact answer to that. I, I, um, the factors there are the fish that it eats, um, competition from other things like um, and hingas or cormorants or alligators maybe, or other fish. Um, uh, loon chicks are susceptible to a number of predators, including bass and pickerel and uh, bald eagles and things. And so there may be an increase of those as we move further south. Um, also, there may be um, something about their nesting needs or the vegetation they need, um, but I don't quite know the answer. Well, once again, Nick, thank you so much. This has been an extremely informative talk and I wanted to remind people that we have recorded this program and we'll be posting it afterwards on the Camden Public Library Program's YouTube channel. And I know that uh, we've had a lot of thank yous coming in, so I'll acknowledge that. And I wanna turn it over before we sign off um, to Kit Pfeiffer from Midcoast Audubon to talk a little bit more about the upcoming program for next month. Yeah, thanks, Julia, and thank you so much, Nick. That was just extraordinary, and I particularly appreciate your conservation uh, message and some glimmers of hope and some things that we can do. That's so, so important. I invite you all to join us for our next program from Midcoast Audubon. It will be Thursday, January 21st, 2021, and we will have as our guest speakers Barbara Vickery and Scott Widensall, who have co-edited uh, Peter Vickery's Birds of Maine. Uh, check out the book, join us in January and learn some of the behind the scenes of developing that extraordinary new resource that's just been published. And again, thank you so much, Nick. Thank you, Kit. Thank you, Nick. And if you all want to check out any of the upcoming programs that we have from the library, please visit our calendar on librarycamden.org. With that, I wish everyone a happy Thanksgiving and a wonderful evening. Goodbye.
Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye.